Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone, and welcome to um, episode eight of the Stranded live stream. Um, we've this is the first time we actually do the same format twice, so we're we're constantly trying new things. Um, things went so well yesterday that I'll be shocked if we um, complete this without glitches today, but um, I'm sure it'll be fine. And um, for those of you that that have watch us before, um, you know that we've done all these different formats. And we have an email address called stranded at strandberguitars.com where um, I really would like you to watch the archive of, of the shows. They're up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we live stream on Facebook and then put up the archive there. Look through the shows, let us know what you thought about them and if suggest new formats. Uh, we wanna keep this interesting and um, keep going. But this morning, evening, afternoon, um, we have a beautiful bunch of people um, that are going live now. Good morning and evening and afternoon. Good morning. To everyone. Hello. It's, Hello. It is really um, mind boggling to talk to people just spread out all across the globe and also have uh, listeners, viewers, um, also across the world. It's really um, a privilege and uh, a blessing. So how's, how's everyone um, doing? Let's, let's do a super quick um, intro. Um, I'll, I'll go from, from left to right on, on my screen. Aaron, you're, you're first out. Where, where are you and, and what are you up to? So I'm in Kentucky right now. It's 2 a.m. here, but it seems normal with quarantine. So, um, <laughs> yeah, just been been busy with uh, getting ready for releasing new singles and creating more content. Really, that's all you can do right now. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Brock, how about you? Hey, uh, I'm also East Coast. I'm um, in Pennsylvania in the USA right now. Um, I've been hanging in there, you know, working on a couple records, teaching a lot. Uh, working on some wacky content. Yeah, like Sailor Moon that we talked about <laughs> before we went live. <laughs> ben, how about you? I'm in uh, Ventura, California, and I've, I've been practicing and waiting and practicing and waiting. I'm supposed to be touring all summer, so like, you got to figure out what to do now. But been, yeah. you know, holding it together. You You had to basically cut the tour short right you, you were on tour when this happened no we are oh, we were about to leave we we're about to start rehearsing and, and right. leave soon so we're kind of yeah. waiting for information and we don't really know what's going on yeah. nobody really does yet nope that's true mike how about you i'm uh i'm good i'm in i'm in california and uh just getting a a, a new recording rig uh hooked up i haven't had a uh, a decent uh, recording setup at home for about 10 years because I've been just doing mostly recording in other locations. So now's the time to get it together to be able to produce music at home. So that's uh, very much what I'm focused on right now, still putting the pieces together. So I'm glad this microphone is working. I'm, I'm, I'm still testing things. Yeah. And, uh, right. and, uh, and yeah, obviously not doing any touring right now we were halfway through a, a Devin Townsend tour when we had to you know pull up stakes and all fly home yeah, yeah. so uh, we are just waiting just like everybody else to see what happens next yeah no doubt how about you Alex uh, I'm touring a lot uh, like two <laughs> three gigs a day I guess so I actually canceled the gig for tonight sold out course oh. <laughs> uh, I'm in California and yeah I'm, I'm just here in my garage yesterday I almost finished installing a split AC in my new workroom here so I'm <laughs> getting crafty I know much more about ACs now occasionally <laughs> I do play guitar I record for other people still there's a lot of work so I can't complain honestly yeah. Jack how, what's what's the situation on your end? Yeah, I'm good, man. It's um, it's early in Switzerland at the minute. Um, yeah, 
I've basically been working on some of my own music, which is something that I don't think I've ever done before. Um, I think I've shown you some of the, the work. I've been working with a guy mm, yeah. called Owain. Um, so it looks like we've oh, actually... Oh, I love got, his like, stuff. Oh, man, he's he's a freak, isn't he? <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, insane. Yeah, we've got like six tracks together. Um, the teaching work has gone through the roof because of all of this. And then, yeah, it seems like... It's busier than before. I'm gutted like I've lost my sideman gig, shall we say? Like I was literally supposed to be on a, in Ireland the day that the lockdown happened. But um yeah, other than that, I think it's a it's like normal life really, isn't it? Like for us musicians, <laughs> I don't think much has changed really. <laughs> like... Yeah. Right, Connor, how about you? Yeah, so um I'm in England, um, in my bedroom as always, and not much has changed for me um i actually had planned to kind of have a chill out anyway and write new music um so that's all finished and luckily um i've got a normal nine to five job that's not music related it's just kind of to help you know a stable income come in so i've luckily been able to work from home so like after this stream's done i'll be doing my nine to five work <laughs> so that's kind of weird feeling but uh so i got up extra early for this but yeah. that's my kind of deal literally like living my life in my bedroom so not much different i actually think i mean out of all of us i think the uk has actually had the the like the strongest restrictions on on the lockdown of, of yeah. all of us yeah we're definitely not doing the best in terms of like the figures and all that kind of stuff um yeah. and the restrictions of i think it's been about six weeks now for lockdown um, yeah but i don't think it i don't think it's actually enforced that well like i i go out on my my one daily exercise run and you still see a lot of people driving about and stuff so i don't yeah. know i don't know right yeah. right kevin how about you uh i honestly don't really know what's going on right now <laughs> just trying to keep saying um i lost six more gigs today so i know i'm going to be out until at least june and then uh, i'm just working on a couple couple of like demos for for different gear and stuff so but like for on. strandberg <laughs> yeah <laughs> we got some pretty cool the, true so temperament then, then demos got, uh, and the new pickups and stuff that that you yeah done some cool videos awesome. for and then um i have some plugins and some pedals too that I'm, I'm kind of just brainstorming some ideas for but so i've been able to do that though and, and and work on that but then like i think a week and a half ago my audio interface died so i had to figure out that and <laughs> it's a whole learning curve about getting this new one so yeah just trying to stay sane yeah how about you Pliny? Uh, same as always, pretty much. I'm in my bedroom just making music. I kind of feel younger, if anything, because the only thing that I've done differently in the last few years is go on tour, and now that's off. So it's just kind of wake <laughs> up and play guitar and make music. Um, and I'm just kind of watching things in the future get cancelled. Like I was meant to come to Europe in July, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. And we'll just see, I guess. But yeah, it's all good. Yeah, time time warp, I guess, back to a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you had you had already planned though, uh, like a writing time the these few months at least. Yeah, yeah, I was I would probably would have been wanting to go into a recording studio to record drums around now, uh, which isn't possible because no one's allowed to leave. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's kind of just giving me more time in a good way i guess it'll start yeah. becoming kind of like nervous when do we actually get to tour again in a couple of months but for now it's just kind of fun yeah how about you paul um i'm working on a cynic record and um just uh laying low in la um yeah, that's I was on tour, obviously doing the acoustic stuff, and it got canceled after five shows. Mm -hmm. And we had a uh, twenty-three, twenty-four dates or something total. So it was um, it's a little uh, frustrating to prepare that much for a tour and have it all kiboshed um, a weekend right when you're getting your groove. 
but yeah. um but you know we're as a musician i think we learn to adapt pretty well <laughs> especially if if you don't um have any backup plan so you just work with what what's happening and thankfully i'm in my studio just playing like a maniac right now working on new music so mm. yeah because we, we were going to meet in in vienna on on your tour right. yeah yeah Han, Han and i were gonna uh, go to the opera and, and stuff and, and meet meet up with you and then uh yeah all got canceled yeah strange times but uh since when when i have you on the um, line tell us very briefly about the uh the invention that you uh posted about before um this method you developed for um communicating with with patients who who can't speak i thought that was absolutely fascinating um yeah it's uh basically an ex partner and i um were i was working as a volunteer at the time at ucla and he was working as a nurse and we encountered a problem you know and usually that when you have a problem you try and come up with a solution the problem was that intubated patients had no way to communicate in this environment um and i um me and i kind of came up with this board this device essentially to help somebody who's got a tube down their throat who's probably post surgery some kind of transplant situation to um to be able to communicate with their caretakers and people around them and um and just get their basic needs met and we, is, we is went that ahead a, is that like a standard tool now that that is being used in in healthcare? it's like in it's a, it's in a few thousand hospitals you know um it's it should be standard but what we learned and he's still working on it he's actually a pediatric anesthesiologist now at Seattle Children's Hospital but um yeah we learned that the hospital industry unlike most medical industries it's it's ruled by money and not by you know the actual humanitarian aspect for the most part mm. and so to get in there and to get a product like that integrated when even though you have all the research behind to prove that it really helps people doesn't necessarily mean it'll make it in you know yes. um but uh but it's it's made its way and it's helped a lot of people and it's still getting out there which is really nice especially now cuz obviously intubation is a conversation it's it would never normally be a public thing yeah. but we yeah. saw that there was actually a, a window here to for make, get people to pay attention to it and um so thankfully it's it's and that post and some other things he's been doing have it seems to have really picked up because yeah. they're because we're donating them to a bunch of hospitals and all over the world and it it helps people actually with multiple languages it's all bilingual so um yeah it's it's cool it's i'm i'm grateful to see it get some legs again after all these years yeah yeah That's it's fantastic. yeah it's just fascinating to to hear about that that part of your life which <laughs> it was just uh, unexpected i know you're you're in, inventing and designing jewelry and stuff now but that's that's like a normal creative process not this other thing was almost like engineering yeah cool. yeah definitely more and especially the the research side of it it got very technical and proper research which was yeah. a whole other world um yeah. but uh, yeah nice. it's interesting you know it's interesting the the way the directions our lives will move <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. Has, has anyone else done something like totally unexpected or something in, in a different field entirely than, than music? I guess I'm not. not a bus <laughs> machine. I mean, I'm, I'm an IT genius, of course, programmer, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I've, guitar builder is probably the, the last thing I would call myself, but here I am. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I th I think let's let's like get get things started as as advertised with with um, people asking each other topics. So Aaron, you're first out and and um, bring up a topic and or ask Brock uh, a question. Cool. Okay. Um. So my question has to do with like genre bending. I like to hear other people's uh like I guess answers to this. 
Um, genre bending and like fusing, dif like fusing different genres together seems to be like a really common thing now in music. So I was just curious as to like, how do you go about like putting different genres in your music? Or do you even think about it? Like when you, when you write music? I am actively obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> that's a per perfect question. Uh, so for, for me, my style of music that I typically uh, play and write is, you know, typically falls into that like math rock category, um, which I think is best utilized when fused with other things. You know, uh, as much as I love the pure mathy goodness, um, I'm also really, really into, you know, jazz and classical music, as well as, you know, newer styles and things like you know, elements from like pop punk, for instance, I think is really exciting. I think the energy of a genre like that is fun to take and combine with like the harmonic vocabulary of jazz, for instance, because when you, when you put those two things together by themselves, it, it's actually hilarious. Um, you know, it's like, I've done like jazz reharmonizations in the past of like fallout boy songs. And it's just so funny to me, but yeah. through this like lens of kind of like mathy sporadic music, it kind of makes sense. It kind of gets there. And I think that that's really fascinating how, you know, these little elements from all these completely seemingly unrelated places can kind of tie into each other in a new way um, that brings value to each of their own respective places. Because um, like, I don't know, whenever I play shows in new places and meet new people, um, pre-quarantine, of course, um, you know, people are always asking me about like, like, what do I listen to? Like, what is that? You know, how do the genres combine? And, you know, I think even insofar as just an attitude, right? To take an attitude from one style of music and say like, well, what if that was somewhere else? You know, what if I came at math rock with like a punk attitude? Or what if I came at jazz with like a punk attitude? And that's also really fun. Exactly. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of like Naked City. You ever heard Naked City? I don't know yep. if I have. Oh like a John Zorn band saxophone player. Uh, he basically broke the rock band format and you know, that band like changes genre every bar and it's just insane. <laughs> um, but That's you know, cool. yeah, when you, I feel like when you combine um, like different genres in your music, you also can bring people, groups of people together that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't normally see together. You know, like I've seen, like I went to an issues concert and I've seen people who love country go to an issues concert just because the guy has like an, like an accent kind of like a country accent but i mean like you said taking small things from the genres can really like open up whole new worlds yeah absolutely i i think you know musically before i got into math rock i come from like a like a third stream music background um which you know combining sort of like improvisation with like the classical tradition and sort of like blurring the lines between um you know abstract things like I really like avant-garde music personally and so the idea of like you know improvising on like a, a classical tune or improvising on like a, a heavily composed piece um I think is really cool and uh yeah so I don't know I'm always fascinated with genres they're always they're always fun to fun to poke at you know because the best music I feel like falls between the cracks right the best music in my opinion at least a lot of my favorite bands it's hard for me to say like well, that's an indie band or that's like a math rock band. It's like, I, they kind of, they kind of blur the lines a little bit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> Beck, welcome to Hello, the screen. How are you all? <laughs> good. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm really busy. Ah, that's awesome. We're, we're talking oh, about uh stronger bending and you've, you've, You've done a stronger transformation, I think, in, in your music. Yeah. Do you want well, to summarize in, to... in 30 seconds? <laughs> so I met you at the uh, guitar festival in Melbourne when I was mm. the front woman of an all-girl punk rock band called Racket. Oh. And then I, we were in the studio tracking guitars for our last EP in 2007. Uh, 18 and then Ali our bass player came out with a positive pregnancy test so the whole band dismembered and chose different life paths and I stuck with the name and released and redefined myself as an electronic EDM punk artist so now I'm still using your Strandberg guitar and um, I'm just using it in a different way so instead of like you know bashing out bar chords I'm now doing more intricate lead 
like melody line work and singing through auto tune, which is like, if you had have asked me that back when I was like playing diehard rock, I, I would have said like, that's that shit. But now I love it. <laughs> so your, your live setup is, is bass, guitar vocals and backing tracks. Yeah, it's a Strandberg bass, a Strandberg oh. guitar for me. And oh. then um, I have uh, eight channels running through um, an interface with an in-ears system and running it all through Ableton Live. Right. Uh, sometimes in FBS. So basically, yeah. we're, we're, uh, we're going around here um, asking people questions and bringing up topics. So you, you'll cool. come up again. Uh, soon enough. Brock, um, say something intelligent to Ben or ask him something um, profound. So <laughs> I have a sort of similar question to the one that was asked to me, although, you know, perhaps in a different direction. Um, I was, I was wondering what you'd think of, you know, where is music going? What's the, what's the, you know, what's next? Where do we, where do we go from here? Well, any, any answer is going to be wrong. Um, but it's the best part. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Um, I, I like looking at patterns in, in everything. Anything that I can see patterns and I enjoy it, it kind of gives me a little bit of comfort. And I think we're at a point now where the pattern is, is pretty unpredictable because we see, we, we kind of see in society the effects of having the internet for 20 years. And it's, it's not like having the internet for five years. That was fun. Once we got past 10 years, it started to get a little bizarre. And now 20 years deep into everybody being connected to every human on earth all the time at the same time, we see weird tribal clan-like stuff kind of evolving right in front of our eyes with people that we know, people we thought we recognized. And I think that pattern will repeat or at least influence how people, uh, how people ex experience art or create art. Um, everything from the, the immediacy of it, from how fast something can become beloved by a group of people and become part of their, their immediate culture and that group to, um, to even the technology to make art, the speed that it can be made at. I think all these things are gonna affect it in ways that you can't look back at the 70s and be like, oh, it was like when, when they started using 24 track instead of eight track or be like, oh, when everything went digital in the 90s. And there's nothing uh, as far as pattern wise that, that looks like today in, in my shallow understanding of anything. So I'm, what happens next? I think, it, I think with pop music, it's going to have to be louder, faster, and it's gonna to have to be able to get people's attention over the most insane racket at this, no, no offense to the name of your band. Um, I love it. <laughs> but it's going to have to get people's attention and somehow make them nostalgic and make them have the feels at the same time. And I, uh, good luck with whoever's job it is to figure that out. I think with, uh, with every other form of music, people are really going to be able to speak directly to their audience in a more narrower kind of way with their audience being more in tune with them they're all going to be able to find each other but i think things are going to go faster so old dinosaurs like me are going to have a hard time keeping up and uh, that's has, has anyone gotten uh, exposed to any of the like 5g technologies that are coming up now which would basically allow you to like jam in real time distributed do where do they have that do they have that in a in the states yet? Sweden. <laughs> no, no, there, there's no real 5G. But uh, certainly, um, I mean, some some of the tech companies that are driving the innovation are Swedish companies. So the, they're doing they're doing pilots, and, and um, the, there are some demos out there with like distributed real time uh, jamming. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that would allow you to like reach your audience in, in a totally different way and, and more interactive. Yeah, you'd definitely be able to stream a concert while riding the bus. Yeah. 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 So far, I've only seen uh, concerts in Minecraft. <laughs> Very strange phenomenon. <laughs>
But how how much do all of you like engage directly with with your fans? And and did you earlier and and now it, it's like evolved in, into something less it's, direct? It's tricky for everyone. I think everyone's kind of forced into figuring it out more because they're not going to be able to get in the same room. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have it to was, like figure out ways to be more personal. Yeah, I I I had a, a website in 1994. That's when, that's when Keneally dot com started. So I, I yeah. was and I was blog wasn't a word yet, but I was writing stuff. You know, just like pouring my heart out on the website, uh, not feeling like anybody was was reading it. You know, it 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 all seemed kind of abstract at that time, but it turned out that people were reading it, and I was I was really you know I was I was, I was connecting and I was and I was sharing a lot. And then as, as time has gone on, and, and I think this kind of uh, relates to what Ben was saying about as, you know, as the internet, the, the reality of the internet has kind of settled in over time and sort of the, the dark undercurrent of it starts to become evident. I've, I've found myself sharing less and less o over time and, and just like holding my, my cards a little closer to the vest. And now, of course, uh, I, I, like I'm getting ready to get into a much more productive period and I'm, I'm planning on using Patreon and, and Bandcamp mm -hmm. and Twitch, Twitch and, and just like different platforms that I've never even like dealt with before. And part of that process is going to be trying to get back into that frame of mind that I was in in the nineties where I was a lot more forthcoming, a lot more, uh, you know, trying to get that deeper connection with, with the, the, the people that are paying attention. Mm -hmm. yeah they, yeah um, i'm sure there's lemonade to be made out of these lemons somehow yeah yeah so, i think for me, uh this has actually been like a, a really um fruitful period for me um having all of the shows cancelled i guess like the experience that i'm having is if you're a forward thinker and you have an idea and motivation, the ability to connect and build resources with people that prior to COVID-19 were out of your reach is more possible now. For example, just as my personal experience, I've been trying to um, get booked by a company called Heaps Gay in Australia who organise um, Mardi Gras and have a very strong hold on the LGBTQI community where I not only relate to, but I feel like that they're, they're the kind of um, audience that will suit my new music. And I've been trying relentlessly to get a gig with them. And then COVID-19 hit and I came up with this idea to create a show called Loud and Queer TV that recreates my ideal night out, which is drag queens and live music. And mm. I pitched it to them and for the first time ever, they replied and I partnered with them and now I'm the producer of a TV show with Heaps Gay curating 20 um, live, live artists from all around the world and in a massive broadcasting studio with drag queens and, like, this, this could never have happened for me without COVID. Uh -huh. It's just that I, you know, I have a real passion for innovation which is why I love what you guys do, especially you, Ola. So I think it's an opportunity to, like, be a leader in a field that might not exist yet. Yeah. That's awesome. And, yeah, it's very true. I, I think we're going to see a lot of new things that hopefully become permanent over, over time. Uh, and it's cool stuff. So how's, Thanks. um for you, Ola, have you found... Like, how's the experience for your business? Have you found that it's been an impact on guitar sales? Have people, you know, pulled back or are they using this opportunity to engage more with your product? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we, uh, I was kind of hoping to get some downtime and, and, and do some internalizing and, and process improvement, et cetera. And we'd all like document stuff and put processes in place and, and, become better but we've, we've just been super busy <laughs> throughout uh yeah because pe people do want to um they want to play guitars they they want to buy new guitars so um i shouldn't complain um for sure now we're That's getting right. into a point where um we're kind of 
the stock situation is becoming uh, pretty dire and, and shipments are delayed from, from the factory, etc. So then maybe we'll have that downtime in, in the end. But I'm, I'm just super happy to have um, gotten the opportunity to, to do this live stream. Um, I've had the idea for a long time to do something like this and, and this finally got me kicked in gear. So it's, yeah. I think it's definitely an upside. Great. So moving on, Ben, ask uh, Mike a question or, or bring up a topic. Oh, sweet. Uh, I, right before this happened, there were two shows that I really wanted to go see that I ended up not being able to go to. And they were really high up on my, my list. And one thing that I think is really interesting is what what's on people's bucket lists of concerts to see what's what's at the top like not what's your number one or what's your favorite or what's the hardest one to answer but what if you just off the top of your head what concerts are you are at the top of your list to go see if you had to come up with them now oh like what if when it's possible to go see shows again what shows would i want to see the most yeah who who do you want to see on stage who's who's what are you looking forward to well i mean uh, any opportunity to see radiohead is always is always one that, mm. that i i try to grab you know that's that always tends to be a, a really memorable thing um that that was the first thing that could that come to mind but uh, I guess slightly more selfishly that of of all the shows that I wasn't able to to do this summer, the one that was most disappointing is because I also wanted to see it, and that was uh, I was going to be in in the Zappa band opening for King Crimson for six weeks, wow. and uh, and you know I was excited about playing obviously, but I was arguably just as excited about watching six weeks worth of King Crimson shows because oh, uh, I love hey. those guys. Um, so that's been rescheduled for exactly one year later. We were supposed to be out in June and July, uh, but now we're going out in June and July, 2021, uh, you know, assuming that all goes well, honestly, I guess in my heart, that's, I, is what's going to make me happier than, than anything I can imagine to like, when, when we finish our first opening act, uh, Zappa band set, and then, you know, we go backstage and shake off the show. And then I head back out in the venue and watch King Crimson. Yeah. That is going to be, you know, I'm going to just be speechless. That, but the, I mean, the whole experience of being able to go out and do shows again is is going to be very emotional. We're all going to feel that when when we're able to get back out on a stage again and and connect with an audience. That's that's going to be like some of the most powerful and memorable things that that happen to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, but that's that's it that's it the, the seeing that first crimson show i, I just can't wait that's uh, right that's incredible anyone, <laughs> does anyone else have like a bucket bucket list concert you want to dying to see i was gonna see t grand hamasian tomorrow oh, i yeah. was gonna go see him too in, in la i was gonna go see him um and that was one of the two shows that I, him and Jonathan Barber were the two shows that I bought tickets to. It was like, I'm going, I'm going. It's like, you're not going. Oh, I was going to transcribe his entire live show because he's playing new songs. Um, and I had been I prepping my brain man. to do that <laughs> for like weeks. And oh, now I have to transcribe something else. <laughs> I was just going to go and get bucked off the horse and trying to count the grooves and just be like, how does he do it? <laughs> So, Mike, um, ask uh, Alex something. Alex, my uh, my normalizer too, buddy. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, here's this is what I was thinking of. I guess it's kind of a two part question, and it, it kind of goes back to uh, when, whenever you first, as a child or whatever, kind of got the feeling of of wow, I really want to play music, and this this is where I see my life headed. And kind of if, if you visualized what that was going to be like, and then compare that to whatever, when I say this, just the first thing that comes to your mind, the most satisfying musical experience you've ever had, like the, the, the most, whatever, most powerful or validating or closest to whatever you consider to be perfect. Um, 
and sort of com uh, com contrast those two things, what you thought it was going to be like when you were a kid and then what the, actually the, the, the most incredible thing was. Honestly, I had no real idea what, what, what it would be and I didn't have any expectations. I just had the love for music and, and just wanted to do it. So I can't really answer that. I didn't see myself anywhere. I just right. want to play music and just do it like relentlessly. That was, right. and how I old were know. you? How old were you when, when you realized that? I think around well, I started when I, I, I was always interested in music. I started with guitar lessons, which happened to be good classical guitar lessons because there wasn't anything else in Vienna, Austria, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I was eight. And soon I found out, no, that wasn't the style of guitar that I wanted, but it took me a couple of years. And so around 11, 12 or so, I was already learning songs. My, my sister was a big Queen fan, so I learned some Queen songs. First, she was a Kiss fan, but fortunately, she, she switched to Queen. That was good. <laughs> and then so I had my, my transition in, into those guys, and, and around... I don't know, 11, 12, I knew I, I really want to take this seriously. And and I think I got in, interested in jazz maybe in at 13 or so. But I didn't see myself anywhere. I just wanted to 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 be able to play it. That 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 was good. And and I didn't want to learn it verbatim. I wanted to I wanted to know what's going on so I can come up with something. That was always there. So you you didn't like you weren't like aping anybody's style from even oh from I constantly a... I was always yeah like everyone I'm uh, emulating, but being an old fart now, I realized uh, what a big mistake yeah because once you learn something it's really hard not to use it right um, <laughs> so I, I have a little story I I mean I. I've listened to Holdsworth a lot, as maybe some people can tell, and I'm, I think I have three licks of Alan's. But I was also good friends with Alan's, and one, one day we talked on the phone, really nice, blah, blah, blah. And when I hung up, I said, I have to go to a gig. I was playing at the Baked Potato. Who was there? Alan in the audience. Wow. And I thought, God damn it. Yeah. Now those <laughs> three little things that I have, I cannot play them. Uh, <laughs> I realized how difficult it is because it's already motor memory. And if he's not there, maybe the other ones won't realize that I'm weaving it in. Uh, but I really, I, I had the discipline not to play that, but I realized how difficult it is. So after that, so I survived. I'm still alive. And he liked <laughs> the gig. So that was, that was satisfying. But after that, I, I really thought, man, I, I should have never learned any licks from, from anybody else. And that would be my advice for anyone else, because once you experience that, you just go, Argh. you know, you have it in your hands and, and, and you want to go there and you want to play it. But then you go, oh, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. So that was that. <laughs> and the second part of your question, I don't know, the most gratifying thing I'll name one which was very gratifying. I, uh, the first time I played with Bozio, that it was, we played in Vienna and we arranged for his string quartet and woodwind quartet. So I did the strings, I arranged the strings. He sent MIDI files where a trill, like a MIDI trill is like two pages. <laughs> and, uh, so I condensed that and I back then by hand, I didn't have a printer. Um, oh my God and rehearsed it with the string with the string quartet and I thought oh they are tuned in fifths so I write lots of fifths for them and only to find out no that's the only interval we can't really play that well <laughs> okay so I rearranged it. it was a lot of work and then we also played trio pieces because uh so it was bass clarinet drums and guitar nice and that was just a really good experience a it was a relief that Finally, we premiered his his pieces, but I also wrote three pieces for that particular lineup, and that went so well that he asked me, "Hey, would you would you like to record with me?" And I said, "Wait a second, yes." <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the beginning with Terry. That, that was that was like a good or big thing. I don't know. I mean, 
as soon as I finish that sentence, something else will come to my mind where I go. Of course, oh, but that's that was great. But that I, was, I don't know. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> that was bad. Yeah. Who uh, who who else has like your hero's licks committed to muscle memory, and then you consciously have to avoid them? Not Anyone not else like recognize it, that? Yeah. <laughs> There's a I, I I've bitten a lot of print stuff. <laughs> I never really, uh, I never really learned uh, a bunch of Zappa licks, but I, I listened to him so much that his, his just his general phrasing approach got so baked into mine, and I'm, and I'm always trying to, to like steer myself away from that, and it's, 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 it's really hard, you know, because sometimes it just feels like the right thing to do. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I learned a lot of John Petrucci licks and stuff uh, from Dream Theater, so whenever I'm coming to do like a guest solo or summit for someone like a client, I always end up kind of putting in these like shred alternate picking lines and it just sounds like John Petrucci. So if someone out there wants discount John Petrucci on the music, <laughs> then let me know. <laughs> so you I won't rip off, on yet. <laughs> I can't rip off Tigran if I tune my piano to another tuning system or if I'm doing it on guitar. <laughs> All right, Alex, uh, yeah. ask Jack something. Okay, Jack, I've got, a, I've got plenty of questions. A, did you expect that I would ask you the question? <laughs> <laughs> Number one. No. Second, can you guess my question? <laughs> With your mind, Alex? No, no chance. <laughs> no, obviously, I didn't prepare a question. Uh, but but I, I want to ask you something. Uh, well, you're in a different time zone, but, but uh, what was the... Tell me your three favorite piano players. Three favorite piano players. Yeah, because sometimes I feel when we when, when there are too many guitar or, or string instruments, I mean, because we have a bass player as well, but when there are too many guitarists, uh, music gets lost a little bit. And mm -hmm. so uh, I wanted to ask you, or at least one favorite piano player. Uh, I mean, and if we're talking, if we're talking like super modern guys, then. I have been listening to a load of Jacob Collier recently. I do really like him. I know he's not first and foremost a piano player, but the way in which he explores the instrument, yeah, it fascinates me. But I mean, if we talk old school, then obviously the guys like Stevie, Herbie Hancock, Oscar Peterson, people like this, like, man, I, I love it. I'm a massive, believe it or not, like 70s, 80s funk and soul fan. So like anything Stevie Wonder, is is way <laughs> up on my list but yeah okay. it's, i always find that fascinating like choosing different instruments like is is the one instrument that you wish that you would have played other than guitar say that again the last is, sentence sorry is there one instrument that you wish you would have picked up other than guitar like you know if you could go back uh if i could go back trumpet yeah it would have been great because a good trumpet player always makes good money because they need them. <laughs> uh, and I'm practicing drums quite a bit now. So I do have a second instrument. So I'm, I'm really practicing. Um, I'm not good, but, but I'm practicing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, talking about that, though, that's piano. I, it's something I wish I'd have done years ago, just the amount of skills that you can kind of gather from that, whether it's production, MIDI stuff, that's one thing which I always yeah. find, like I'm lacking behind because I can't physically do it. I mean, I'm one of these guys, one finger. <laughs> you know? but yeah, that is something that I really wish that I'd have done back yeah. in the day. Like, yeah, whenever I feel like I accomplished something harmonically, I mean, I, I, I listen to piano players and go, wow, I'm a dwarf. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> this is nothing. It, it's uh -huh. crazy, isn't it, really, the restrictions that we have with our yeah. instrument in terms of, like, comping and stuff like that. It always fascinates me how a keyboard player can think. Like, it's it's a whole different world, isn't it, for us, something that a voice and that's, like, physically impossible to play for them is, like, three notes next to each other. <laughs> but we have voicings yeah. that they can play, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we can bend like strings. Better, better bend. Ben, ben you're, you're like a proper multi-instrumentalist. What, what, what do you consider like your, <clears throat> your primary instrument? Drums. Drums? Really? Yeah, that was what I started on. And, and then I started playing bass 
And then I started playing guitar. And the, the, the one that's eluded me is this guy back here at the piano. I listen to it. I love it. It can bring me to tears with two notes. But I just am an absolute brick on that instrument. <laughs> who, who else can, can like say that, that they proficient in, in another instrument? Piano is actually my main instrument. Right. Um, but I've also played in a few bands on drums. Um, and I see, I don't know, I see them all kind of, they all relate in my head. I play ukulele with a whammy bar. That's my, that was, that's my other instrument. <laughs> apparently, apparently I, I was, so I was filing for, for unemployment in the States the other day and under skills as like, when you type in your guitar player, uh, some of the, the professional skills that pops up is by bagpipes. And I can't delete it, so apparently I have to get on that. <laughs> nice one. I hope they won't hold it, hold that to you <laughs> at a later date. Got to prove your uh, lost I, income from from bagpipe gigs. <laughs> I uh, I started on on keyboard when I was seven, and then guitar when I was eleven. So I, I, I'm. I don't think of myself as a keyboardist primarily more than a guitar player. I kind of hold them both equally and I'll play bass yeah. and drums and I'll, I'll play bass and drums on my own records, but I won't necessarily hire myself out to anyone else as no. a drummer. Definitely. We well, play, like, you play a lot of keyboards live though. And, and I guess. Yeah. De depending on the, on the gig, like with, with, uh, with Devin, I was pretty much just playing guitar unless he decided to make me play uh, the Black Page on 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 keyboard and guitar at the same time. Uh, but uh, yeah, with the, the lot of gig, like when Satriani hired me, it was just as a keyboard player. It was three years into that gig before I, I even picked up a guitar. Uh, so it's uh, obviously it's nice to be able to provide different different services as as people need them. Yeah, nice one. So Jack, uh, ask uh, Connor something. Yo, Connor, I can't believe we've never met before, man. Both people. No, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so close together as well, Liverpool. And is it Preston you're from? Is it? Yeah, yeah, Preston. Yeah. Nice man. No, um, one thing then I was going to ask. I mean, obviously, I'm like Alex. I haven't really prepared anything massively, but <laughs> I was going to say, how do you see like the UK scene recovering from this? In terms mm. of not just like COVID nineteen, but also like there's the whole thing of Brexit looming over us, and Ooh. how you know <laughs> how how an artist is going to survive, you know, in that in that climate. Yeah, that's a really good question. Tough one. Um, I think the main thing that I've been kind of doing, I can only speak from my personal experience of this whole situation. But, but I mean, I started out this whole journey that I've only just begun really on the internet. Um, so I know we were talking about the internet before, how it kind of has this like this, this dark looming like presence, but I've been able to connect with like nearly all of you guys in one way or another because of the internet. I wouldn't, I just flat out would not know any of you without the internet. So that's been really good. Um, I think there's been like a new wave of Instagram guitarists and musicians that have come through and like especially in like the past month or so everyone's posting more and more videos and everyone's kind of like jumping on instagram live streams and stuff um so definitely for me like the best way that i have built up like a little bit of an audience is through the internet like even before covid i, I wasn't playing gigs anyway because i'm just not not quite there yet so i think if the timing's right for me like maybe like at the end of 2020 when all this is kind of like over fingers crossed and like gigs start up again and that's when i'll be kind of ready to you know get on my feet start gigging and stuff and i think you know for a lot of musicians just just play your cards right you know we've been dealt a hand with covid19 so focus on the things that you can do rather than what you can't so obviously no one could play gigs right now so focus on guest solos skype lessons that kind of thing make a few videos demos that kind of thing just to kind of keep different streams of income coming in um i mean that's what i'm trying to do anyway uh like you know finish up that album that you never had time to because you had a gig that night i don't know you know that's what i've been doing <laughs> so 
Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of albums coming out in the next few months. Like mm-hmm. mine will be. I'm sure like a few of you guys have got stuff in the works as well, purely because of the situation. So, I mean, we're going to get a load of music because of this regardless. So, you know, try to see it as like a positive kind of thing, I think. Spot yeah on. and the the virus not going to care about brexit either so maybe actually yeah. maybe we're putting a lot of stuff in place now that will ease the the brexit uh yeah situation. yeah i think brexit kind of took a backseat when covid hit i think it was it was around january when it was all supposed to happen and then covid kind of was at the front door like hello <laughs> yeah see you later <laughs> yeah. yeah interesting times ahead Cool. Well, Connor, ask uh, Kevin something. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Hey, what's uh, up? What's up, man? Um, so I actually had quite an interesting question. I wanted to get it off the topic of music briefly. So I thought about this last night. And my question for you is, um, do you have an interesting hobby that might be like quirky, interesting, that isn't music related that we might not expect from you? Um. Honestly, I don't. I I work out, <laughs> and I yeah, work man. out. And I play play, and everything else is pretty much music related, basically. Which kind of sounds a little bit sad when everybody, <laughs> when, whenever anybody asks. But I mean, it's like I I, I love it though. So in my defense, yeah. I sadly sadly I don't have like any. Any, any like particular things that I, I like to do or or anything like that. Mm. So if you weren't doing music, do you think you'd you'd struggle trying to think of like another career that you'd enjoy? Um, I tend to be like I I honestly feel like it, it's almost like a like a little bit of like a, an artistic quality. Like I get super obsessed with whatever I get into, yeah. and so like. Um, uh, when I was, uh, before I played guitar, when I was like 10 years old, I was like, uh, I think I saw uh, like a TV show about like, um, like court and like, I wanted to be a prosecutor to like get those bad guys in jail. <laughs> I, I got super obsessed with it. And, like My parents bought me like the Norwegian law book, like this huge law book that I read when I was like 10 years old. No way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of I, I get kind of obsessive with whatever I'm I'm, I'm into, and and if it wasn't music, I would have been soaked in into whatever uh, other thing that I, I liked. So yeah, I think that's a good personality trait for a musician because it, it you just fo- super focus on getting that perfection, whether it's like a solo take or something. Yeah, absolutely. But you're you're from Norway, Kevin. You you would be cross country skier, short shorty. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably would. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, the swedish stereotype of norwegians is all you do is like cross-country skiing yeah <laughs> the, does anyone have a, a quirky hobby outside of music ping pong yeah same nice Ooh. whoa but also uh i've been competing in super smash brothers melee for the nintendo gamecube oh no way that's sick I just got ranked in my state. It's a little state, but I'll take it. <laughs> Are you like competing for money for that kind of thing? It's like a prize pool. Yeah. Um, oh, that's sick. But yeah, I so I've been dissecting that. It's actually like way harder than I thought it would be, and I like that a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's in. Uh, it's fascinating that that these things exist. I've I've had my my kids also like do that competitively. It's fascinating yeah there's a lot of money in, in that kind of area i think these days yeah. esports and that kind of thing yeah for sure so kevin ask uh, Pliny something Pliny, um what's up man um hey. I wanna, ask your question I ask you um what kind of drives you into like a flow kind of a state like either when it's writing or improvising or just playing in general like what kind of tends to occupy your mind whenever you get into that uh that kind of good place where like everything is just just streaming out of you in a, in a good way whenever you have like your good playing days or anything like that what kind of drives that to you luck 
<laughs> pure luck. Yeah, that's like that's like the weird point because getting inspired in the first place, I feel like, is often a case of pure luck, and then doing something with it is where you're like kind of just grabbing at it. Like if you have a song idea or something that's cool, once I have that, I kind of know like I'm going to play around with a keyboard, see what I can add to it, see what sections I can add to it, and that can take up a whole day, and I'll forget to eat and forget to like do anything that human beings are meant to do. Yeah. Um, but getting into that state, no idea. I wish yeah, I knew. Like, yeah. then, like, go grab a coffee or go for a walk or, or anything kind of listening to music that you like. Or I will do literally those three things every day. Like I'll have a coffee, go for a long walk and listen to music. Um, I found that walking and listening to music is really helpful once I have a song that I'm working on because I'll just listen to whatever I like at the time, doesn't matter the genre, and try and steal something from it. So it could be like a dance track or something and hear one like EQ trick in a build up and be like, oh, I can take that and use that in this song that I'm working on. Um, so that's, I guess that's how I kind of keep the momentum going once it started. Um, I know some people don't like to listen to other music when they're making music in case it sort of like finds its way in. Um, but I guess I've found that doing the opposite can kind of be helpful because you can steal from so many places that no one will ever know. Awesome. Do you have any tricks? Um, Do you play guitar every day? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I think... Play? I, I tend to focus on uh, the physical feeling of of the strings and kind of you, you know how that feeling is like sometimes like the guitar plays you or sometimes you play the guitar and I, I try to like get into that like when I if I'm able to just detach of like what I ever I want to hear myself and able to kind of just feel the feeling of like whatever part of the fretboard they feel and, and like how the strings feel like are they old is there a lot of uh, nasty dead skin on it like anything like that and like that kind of drives whatever is coming out from there i think to me super bad to answer but <laughs> <laughs> But can, does anyone here, like, we, we had this question uh, yesterday, does anyone here, like, schedule time for, like, proper music work? Or or is it, to what extent is, is it, like, purely inspiration-driven? Because I think kind of what came up yesterday was, like, that, that spark, the initial idea, was almost always, like, an accident or, or something that just happened. But then the process beyond yeah. that could be more structured and, and planned. I mean, I think the way I approach writing in general is to maybe set like, set like a day to be like, okay, on Saturday, I'm going to do, I'm going to do music stuff for like the whole afternoon. And maybe in that afternoon, I might come up with like a melody and I'd be like, oh, okay. And then I'll like, that might be when that inspiration strikes and I might take it into my DAW and then, go from there but i always need that one like little seed to be planted to let it grow because sometimes i'll just be staring into my daw like an empty logic session and then i'll just get a tone going on my guitar and then two hours have gone and then i've just been playing and i've done nothing um mm. so i as soon as i get that one idea then i can i can write like four minutes by accident and then yeah like plenty i always just forget to drink <laughs> like basic human yeah. needs i just yeah. do music for the next <laughs> four hours but Pliny, I've I've sat in on on several of, of your workshops, um, and I get the sense that you do have like some kind of method or or process to to refine a, a song once once the idea is there. Um, that's also this might expose me, but that's partly an invented method in order to be able to say something at a workshop. So it's like a, <laughs> going back and looking at what I do and trying to make it seem like I know what I'm doing in retrospect in order to say, when I make music, this is how I do it. Um, but I guess that's always changing. Um, but I guess it more or less fits into the, like, 
random seed of inspiration and then here are all the things that I've been doing for years like add a bass part, add a drum part, um, add another layer, see what that's like, copy and paste the section. Um, I guess it's become sort of formulaic like that. Um, but even that's kind of constantly changing because I'm listening to different kinds of music. So the sort of ideas that I want to throw at my own idea tend to change. And uh, Paul, uh, I mean, you you write for Cynic, but then you have uh, like your other, you have your acoustic uh, stuff going. Like, how, how do you do you approach those processes differently? Though those like compositional processes, or or do they follow like the same process, even though they're entirely different in in, uh, in the end result? That... I mean. The root of it has to be uh, just a, a piece of harmony and melody that I like that survives the test of time. And that once I feel like I have a good foundation, um, I can take it and produce it any which way. And um, so like the song, you know, just getting a good tune without any decoration, without any ornaments is kind of happening regardless of genre and um i think with cynic it's for me it's um it's like a different frequency you know i have to kind of go into another headspace that feels very natural but it's um it's a way that it's produced and played and there's a certain sensibility there that i can't even intellectualize you know it's it's more just like a you just get in there and it finds its but it feels really perfectly natural to do it but really for me just the you know again coming back to a just a really a good melody and, and harmony and that doesn't necessarily mean with the voice just like a solid foundation of a of a tune is really the that's really what I'm most interested in and then the rest is kind of how do you want to produce it you know what's this going to sound like and uh but has, and, and has the, an idea started as like i'm gonna do this solo acoustic and then evolved into cynic song or, or vice versa or are they like separate already at, at the no i've stuff? had a lot of acoustic -y things that went to turn into cynic songs um and i actually you know with a lot of this new material i play a lot of it on acoustic and um but it, i start developing the picking patterns and it's you know it gets more complex than it turns into more of a, a you know a cynic type sound um almost like prog acoustic or something you know and then and then i turn it into a more of a band context i get you know a drummer and my bass player involved and then it really i think that's when it all starts to sound like the band you know it starts to f sound like a project you know versus just these little foundations that again could be taken anywhere so I mean, Cynic for me is definitely a group sound, you know, it's, um, although there's songs that are pretty, uh, laid, you know, stripped back, it is the sound of a few musicians playing together. And, um, and even with this new record, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit struggling because I want to get in a room with the, with the drummer and, um, and he's actually in Atlanta right now. So it's, um, it's but i'm like really just want to jam i want to play <laughs> and play this stuff you know really play it in a room and and flush out the ideas in the room with with my with my my bandmates and um i feel like it gets becomes really alive i've done internet type recordings and and songs and records and it doesn't have the mojo for me at least with this kind of music i i need to I want that kind of in the moment interactive experience with other musicians to kind of bring it to life. Uh -huh. So that's the next phase for us is to just get the three of us in a room and just play, play uh -huh. for a while. And then we'll go properly track everything. Pliny, um, ask Paul something. Hey Paul, how are you? 
<laughs> did, did froze Paul here? I think he froze. Perfect timing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ask Beck something. <laughs> She's still moving. Hey Beck. <laughs> the sun is setting at the same pace for us. Are you in Melbourne? I'm in Sydney. Oh, okay. Yeah, same. I just noticed our two screens, our two backgrounds have gotten darker at the same rate. Yeah. I, live in, I live in an attic, so it gets a little bit darker. <laughs> bit right. spooky, a bit sooner. Where are you? Um, Sydney? Sydney, yeah. What suburb? Uh, like near North Bondi. Oh, sweet. Where are you? Redfern. Oh, cool. I guess we'll never see each other for months. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question for you, since you've changed the sort of music that you're making, have you noticed that the inspiration for the songs you write has, have you deliberately tried to change where they come from or is it the same process but just applied in a different way once you're actually making a song? Well, the album that I've made with Dave Hammer, who is a pop producer but has made all my previous stuff, has really left me with a feeling as a songwriter of I'm very unstable because I come from a country music background and then worked myself into like very um, cookie cutter blues and rock star melodies. Whereas Dave used a lot of minor tones and play and a lot of the music was written on piano. So for me vocally, like it's been an insane challenge and I've had to break a lot of my like go-to songwriting patterns, which has left me after writing that album, I'm a few months out of writing that album, I'm actually like kind of feeling really um, uncomfortable about my songwriting because every time I'm, you know, you can hear from my, maybe my voice, like I'm like a, Fleetwood Mac, like Stevie Nicks, like that's how I write songs on guitar. They come out in, you know, a very quick, organic way. But the artists that I'm inspired by, like ASAP Rocky, Charlie XEX, Alice Long, Geo Gal, um, they're not blues. So yeah. I'm really stuck at the moment between what I'm going to write next for my next album being that the most enjoyable process of writing a song for me is picking up a guitar and going boom, like, you know, um, but then working with producers that are pushing me to do things that aren't natural that I eventually love the sound of. So I don't know, like I'm the same as you, like I'm just like going for long walks up, up the local hill, um, at Moore Park and just like blasting ASAP Rocky and just like, yeah, just pretty much listening to rap flat out. <laughs> like, I don't know why. It's just like, it's very empowering for me. The lyric, the lyrical content of it, it's very like clout. Um, and that's, that's just helping me psychologically like pump myself up. Like, yeah, you got this girl, you know, you got this. Um, so <laughs> I don't know as it, that going from rock to pop and not just like, you know, maybe like a, Taylor Swift pop, but like a pop that's like really jarring. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Maybe we'll have to have a songwriting session. Yeah. Do you think the two will just eventually collide into something weird and unheard before? Either that will happen or I will just start something new and it will be singer songwriter style. It'll yeah. either be. So wait, last part of my question, is the new stuff coming out under the same name? It is. Is it out? It's out. Yeah, so oh, okay. I released, I, I released, I'm, I've released three singles. So I released two of them um, and two of Japan, Oxytoxic and Machinations. And then I've come back to Australia and released I Love You Ali on um, Friday. So I've got like five more singles to go and then crunch time like what's the next step of the evolution and how does my guitar fit in with that that's it so you sort of don't really care what your fan base thinks in terms of honor oh, she's changing 
I care a lot. <laughs> I care so much, but there were some decisions that I've I made and I probably in hindsight wish I had have changed the name because it's so different but there is a, a very like rich narrative to the racket story so for now you know I'm it's just racket 2.0 that's cool I'm a fan of artists that keep a name and make shit of all different styles <laughs> I guess because right. then you find out someone's side project from like 15 years ago under a different name. I like hearing like someone do something unexpected. Anyway. Keep the fans engaged. Well, have That's a listen to my Spotify and you'll hear it goes from, it literally goes from punk, garage, psych, rock, um, and then into auto tune pop with no <laughs> band. It's, yeah, it's pretty wild. Let's see. Um, what do you prefer? What's your artist name under? Like, what do you? Uh, use? Same as screen names, just plenty. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. I mean, I've got all of your um, handles, so I'll check everyone else's music out. Sorry, I didn't get time to do any homework. Paul, welcome back. Hey, sorry we about that. To... I last heard you say plenty asked me a question, and literally my screen went black. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Pliny asked Beck a question, so now Beck can ask you a question, and we'll, we'll have gone all the way around. Okay. All right. And who am I asking? To uh, Paul. To Mask Paul. Okay, well, I guess the most obvious question is, what do you do? <laughs> Aside from, like, how do, how, do you, how do you use your Strandberg in your world? I, um, I use it. It's nice to play electric guitar again because I have a background as electric guitar, but I've been doing acoustic stuff for a while. But uh, I use it in this context lately with this group I have called Cynic, and it's just kind of a progressive experimental sound and um, a lot of very dynamic use of the guitar, you know, from really clean to really heavier stuff. So it's, it, I get to kind of fully use the 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 guitar and all its glory you know i feel like i take it to its edges when i make these types of records you know because you have to really find a lot of different cool sounds and uh yeah. the strandberg always delivers <laughs> do you do you find that the strandberg delivers in um shock value as well shock yeah like i love i love playing my strandberg but the other thing that I love is like when I pull it out everyone's like whoa like what the what the fuck is this like <laughs> you know like do you get that reaction from other people and do you enjoy like I, yeah I mean yeah. funny I feel like we've come a long way with the headless world um you know I've <laughs> seen a pretty long arc with it and yeah. it's definitely way more like accepted now <laughs> than it was yeah. when I first started playing um, and um, it seems, but I do still shockingly still get that question. Where's the headstock, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I just think, wow, where, where have you been? <laughs> you <haven't laughs> been? Cause it's, it's kind of everywhere now at this point, yeah. but, um, but Paul, yeah, I mean, so, you, you, you are like one of the pioneers of, of using headless guitars. Yeah. So back in the day, you know, I feel like, like I, I like people got pissed, <laughs> especially like in metal <laughs> stuff. They were not cool with with Steinbergers, you know. Um, even though people like you know Eddie Van Halen and and Geddy Lee at one point used one, but um, I, I played a, a bass. But yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things where um, it's I I feel like it's gotten pretty normalized now and. The, the the thing about the St the Strandbergs that I think are striking is the beauty, you know, and people in general, the comments I get is just, wow, that is a gorgeous instrument. You know, just mm -hmm. the, um, if they're, if they're non musician types, you know, obviously musicians will comment further and play it and whatnot, but non musical people, I always just get, you know, it just looks like something you could just hang on your wall as a piece of art. You know, it's, 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 they're beautiful instruments aside yeah. from sounding incredible and playing yeah. incredible. Yeah. 
Do yeah, we, we, we actually haven't touched on this. We, we, we did get a couple of questions yesterday and, and another one that I'm showing on screen now. What, what made you fascinated by Strandberg guitars? And I kind of, I mean, when, when I had this live stream concept idea, I, I like intentionally wanted to keep it non-salesy. But on the other hand, I, I do actually think that a lot of the people that are watching, they want to know. Like what? What fascinated you with Strandberg guitars? Like what? What drew you to uh, the brand? Let's let's go well, around. We'll start with Aaron. We we are on a, like borrowed time. I, I usually try to keep this an hour, but yeah, I'm, I'm having such a good time. So let's let's overrun. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, what got me interested in Strandberg was actually oh, that was at Nam. I had seen videos of people playing them. But then I went to Nam and I'm like, I got to go to this booth. And I, I sat down and I'm like, I started playing. I'm like, whoa, this is fan fret. I don't even know. I didn't even know they had fan frets. And I was playing it. And then I realized while I was playing it, they were fan frets. I'm like, oh, this, like, I thought this would mess me up. But it's like a whole nother world of playing. And that and like just the natural acoustics, not even plugging it in. I know on the earlier um, live stream, I heard someone was saying, like, do you ever just unplug it and play it without the amp? And I was just like. I, yeah actually that's what I did like one of the first times I played it so like the natural acoustics of the guitar even not even plugged into an amp are ridiculous uh -huh. so that really really attracted me because when I'm on in the van on the road you know like I can't plug it into an amp in the car so it's great to be able to play it and hear the hear the tones from it cool how about how about you Brock so I, I actually initially got into headless guitars through Cynic um I first heard Cynic and, you know, saw some videos and saw videos of like, you know, um, like some old death concerts too. And I was kind of like, whoa, what is that? Like, I kind of liked it, you know, that there's no headstock. It's sort of an interesting design. And then, you know, as I started picking up playing guitar myself, um, I saw, you know, I started looking at, looking into like every brand I could possibly find, you know, I was like, these all look cool. I'll see what, which ones look the coolest, you know? And, um, eventually I stumbled upon Strandberg and there were so many things about it that were different than all the other guitars. Um, you know, the fan frets, the Endurneck profile, the, the headlessness, the, the body design, all these things sort of together made it really stand out to me. And I was always like, Ooh, that's really cool. There's so many different unique elements of it. And I had this speculation in my head where I was always like, this is either the greatest thing ever, or I just don't have any, you know, I have, will have no idea how to use it. And so I sort of like held this lingering feeling in my head for such a long time until um, eventually I got to, to Berkeley and uh, actually where I met Adam and I played his Strandberg. That was the first time I ever played one. He was sitting in the lobby of Berkeley and I walked in and I was like, that's a Strandberg. Can I play it? Hi, I'm Brock. You know, <laughs> like the, the wrong order of, of introduction, but he was like, you know, he's a, he's a sweetheart. So he was like, yeah, here, <laughs> which I wasn't expecting, but you know, and you know, within like a minute, I was like, "No, no, no!" I was right. This is all. This is the best. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Everything just feels right. Um, nice. How about you, Ben? I've I've always uh, I've always been a fan of headless guitars because I had this guy that lived up the street from me who had a Steinberger in like '87, and he knew how to play all the Ingve stuff. So I was like, "There's nothing cooler than that." Uh, but I also loved. Uh, John Taylor from Duran Duran played Steinberg's like everybody I thought was cool played these and I never really got to experience them until later in life and I actually played them I was like they're pretty cool and then in, the, in recent times I saw uh, first I saw I think it was Misha Mansour pop up Ooh. with a Strandberg and then I saw Tosin pop up one and those guys I know they don't really mess around with with gear so I was like oh what's this all about then a couple years later at NAM, you had a booth set up and I was sneaking around and I picked up the seven string and it, it just was like, oh, they really did it. They did it. They did the damn thing and did it complete. Like, yeah, yeah, I could do this. I could do this. And then I started hounding people to try to track down a guitar and ended up getting a, a guitar, fell in love with it. All my other guitars started collecting dust. And then you guys started teasing the bass. And that really messed me <laughs> up because I, I, play bass for a living so <laughs> i was like yo i gotta get this bass and then when it uh when it got done when it went into production i managed to get a hold of one and i was like this is the same as the guitar it's just it's the right things to do next with the instrument 
Uh-huh. We don't need more plastic and sparkles and like, we don't need afterburners and all this, you know, extra stuff. You know, we think we can play. So that's all I gotta say. <laughs> awesome. What What about you, Mike? Well, it was uh, it was uh, Sean McKee who was the, the the first guy who who told me about them, and he was like repping for you guys. I think in the U.S., just like letting the players know about it, and uh, and he was just texting me saying, "You got to check this out. You got to check this out." And people will often say to me, you got to check this out. And sometimes it, it leads to something and usually it doesn't. But in, in this case, he was real insistent. And, and I was, I was in Chicago playing at this, uh, uh Prague fest, Prague fest at Reggie's. And, uh, and he just showed up with, with the Strandberg and physically put it in my hands and said, you, you got to play this. And, uh, and it, I've played fan fret instruments before and, and always thought that they were cool and I didn't find that that it was the least bit uh, disconcerting or anything. So that was cool. But it was, for me, it was the back of the neck. As soon as I, I I got that, and it was just like, oh my god, this is it's this, it's the kind of thing where you you didn't know you were waiting all your life for something, and then you find out that you actually were, and uh, <laughs> and just the 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 whole ergonomic combination of all the elements. But it was really kind of the back of neck, the back of the neck that that initially sunk its talons into me. And then, and then just gradually I found that there were certain types of melodies that really seemed to, to fit better on that, on that neck and on that instrument than almost any other guitar that I have. And, and as I was last year, we were doing the Zappa hologram thing and I was, you know, looking at the repertoire and sort of, uh, you know, just like casting the show. It said, this is the guitar for this song. This is the guitar for this song. And there's this one piece called Farther Oblivion that has a melody in the middle of it that eventually became a piece called the Bebop Tango. And it's an insane melody. It's like... It's really crazy intervals at, at a rapid pace. And on certain guitars, it was impossible. And then when I played it on the Strandberg, it just like started singing to me you know it's like so i realized that there are just certain things that want to be played on that instrument and uh and it's a it's really a joyful thing because everybody's like fascinated by the way it looks right and if uh-huh. people come up to me and sound check or something like what the hell is that and i'll just you know i'll say well check it out and i'll always say you know it might look weird with the fan frets but really from this perspective it's it doesn't feel weird at all and usually people agree with me that some people are just like, no, man, that freaks me out. And so it's still, you know, just the way you're wired, but uh-huh. without exception, as soon as I put the guitar in somebody's hand and they feel the back of the neck, they're just, they're just sent. Uh, they fall in love with that aspect of it. So uh-huh. that's what did it for me. It's neat. And Alex, you, you're, you're another like headless pioneer in, in the business, I guess. Yeah. I've, I've been playing, um, Steinberger for a long time and I have a build a lat guitar and then you sent me one and I want to mention one really important thing that I adding to everything uh oh, everyone else already said the weight or the lack of weight I think if this is the lightest guitar I've ever played that's sounding better than most of the guitars that I've played uh and you know that's a good thing. I, I, for instance, never was interested in playing a Les Paul because I couldn't lift it. You know, <laughs> it feels like like if, if you're riding a motorcycle and you drop it and you need another guy who to pick it up again. That's the Les Paul for me. Anyway, it's it's a light guitar. Um, it's a great sounding guitar. So that's beautiful. I've got uh, one answer for all headless jokes uh, that that's, uh, when somebody gives me these stupid remarks on headless, I go one penny for every headless joke I endured and I could buy, for instance, the state of California. <laughs> and then when they comment on the frets, the, are they, are they, uh, is there something wrong with the frets? I always go, no, you're probably stoned. <laughs> and that works really well because usually then they question themselves. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm too stoned. Okay. <laughs> So these are my default answers for those <laughs> super intelligent, observant people. Anyway, I keep it short. What about you, Jack? You, you've you you've been exposed to Strandberg for a long time before you made the plunge. Yeah, I think I, I knew you from 
right early on. But I think for me, I always like held off because I was worried that some of like the sideline gigs, like one of the bands that I'm playing with is an 80s Britpop band. So I thought that they wouldn't really take too well to the image. I think that was more the worry, you know, linking back to what Alex said, the whole thing where people people listen with their eyes a lot of the time, don't they, rather than their ears. Mm. But like, um, I think the big turning point for me was when I actually tried Kevin's Strandberg at NAM a few years ago. And I think, I mean, Kevin, if you ever want to get rid of that, I'll happily take it off you, mate. <laughs> it was my favourite guitar. I think the playability really was on another level from what I played before. But yeah, it just took a while. The one thing which I will point out though is like, one thing which I didn't realize I needed is the nature of the ergonomics, like getting on planes, like with the, with a lot of the gigs, like the travel gigs, I've had problems in the past putting on guitar cases, you know, in the overheads. I hate putting guitars underneath. Um, whereas with this, like no one seems to bat an eyelid. I've not had a single problem with someone saying, you know, like, oh, that needs, that's too big, it needs to go in the air, undercarry or whatever it is, you know. Mm. It's great stuff. What about you, Connor? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, I found out about the guitars one day. It was just on YouTube and I found a little video called Pliny Koki and I watched that and uh, I was just like, yeah, yeah, I need one. I need one of those <laughs> immediately. So... I think, funnily enough, it was just the time I checked your website and they, you just released the first OS 6s. And I was like, okay, that's in my price range. I'm going to save up for that. So that's when I got my first one. Like, I'd never even played one before, before I bought one. I know that sounds crazy, but um, yeah, then it, it, it arrived in the morning and I had to go to uni and uh, I played it for like 10 minutes and I was like, I really don't want to go, but I had to leave. I had to leave it. <laughs> I had to go to university for a whole day and I was just thinking about the guitar. Like I was, I was just sat there in my music lectures like, I just want to play that Strandberg right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's how I found out about Strandberg. It's neat. How about you, Kevin? Had, had you... Had been... you... I remember, I remember you, you... Uh, were part of the uh, Strandberg and, and Uppsala Guitar Festival competition. Had, had had you like been exposed to the Strandberg brand before? Uh, not not before. I, I was looking into like something that intrigued me was actually the the wait list that you had for the builds. That kind of like triggered something like uh, like why is there such a big wait list on, on these guitars? Like what's what's up with them? And then um, I met you guys at NAM the, the this or the, the following year or, or or the next NAM, and and I went to try them out and. I really, really like them, and I, I think they're really beautiful. And then this, um, just kept kept chatting with with, with Ed, and uh, when the, I think it was the twenty seven seventeen production guitars were ready. Like he he sent me a loaner to just try out for 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 a month, and and I just I just fell in love with just to to me like the resonance and and the the way. Um, the guitar just um it just it just sounds the, the way like through through the amp and stuff like it it always sounds the way it sounds like acoustically and it's just like it just feels really alive i just really fell fell in love with that and just yeah i just got hooked from 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 there on out cool and plenty what what's your story same sort of beginning as Ben. I saw Tosa and Misha playing them and then sort of took you seriously. Um, and I think, I can't remember, I think I signed up to the wait list around then, but I don't think my spot has even come around now. It's been like 30 years. Um, but then I went to see Intervals and Aaron was playing Strandberg at the time. So I got to play one backstage for like 20 seconds couldn't hear it all i could do was feel it but so the light felt so good um i think then i contacted you and it was great timing because you just started doing production six string models um and then play them same story as everyone else here just the weight and the look and the feel and the sound blew away any other guitar i played to the point where the reason I come to NAM is basically to hang out with you because I'll walk around and someone's like, hey, can you check out this guitar? And I'm just like, why would I want to 
because <laughs> nothing I haven't really aside from like the odd vintage guitar that a friend might own that's not necessarily even nice to play it just might have a lot of character I haven't found anything that has any characteristics that are more attractive than the Strando so there's your sales pitch mm. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff yeah because I mean the, there's there's always room for different guitars for different purposes and uh, I think one of I imagine that one of the things that, that attracts us to these instruments is that they all have their own soul, if, if you will. And whether that's a vintage Gibson or, or a Strat or Honer or Steinberg or Strandberg, uh, but also seemingly identical guitars behave differently and they resonate differently uh and and they just react differently in 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 like ways that you can't really um put your finger on uh, i think that's that's one of the fascinating aspects i actually got uh the prototype that you sent uh yesterday or the day before yeah and it is it's better than the one from before so i guess it's basically perfect now um <laughs> but this guitar my favorite note is C on the high E string and the one before was F sharp on the G string. So that's kind of like now a recording thing, depending on the key I'm in, I might have to pick right. the guitar for if I get to use that note. <laughs> just sort of, yeah. And I mean, uh, you, you've right. really, you've really experienced this because you, we, your first signature guitar was built by WMI in Korea. Yeah. And then we, moved the production to PT Court in, in Indonesia. And I mean, they have identical bill of materials. Uh, but, and I mean, they start off with the same 3D models and they put them through manufacturing the exact same way. But they do end up differently. And, and, and you, you had a definite preference for a good while of, of the Korean made uh, individual. And so, I think that that's really, really fascinating. Um, it, it's a problem, obviously, for, for us as, as builders um, that they're so different. But I think it's a good thing in, 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 in the long run. Yeah, I think this last guitar is officially the best strand that I own, which is good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, because the one, yeah, the one before the, the neck came out a little bit chunkier than, yeah. than we intended. Yes, cool stuff. That that's great to hear. So you 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 just received it then? Yeah, I received it, and this is how lazy I am. I was excited to receive it that day because I had to record a guest solo, and I didn't want to change my strings. So <laughs> that might be the most um, privileged thing I've ever done in my life: is receive a guitar, a fresh guitar to record a solo. But yeah, it was fun. So thank you. Nice, you bet. Well, everyone, I think we, we kind of started with your guitar experience, Paul, so I won't ask you again. Um, we've overrun our allotted time slot grossly, but it was only because I have enjoyed talking to you all so very, very much. So um, just thanks a million to all of you that, that participated uh beck had to run out and um catch your bass player i think um thanks a million to everyone that's that's been watching um does anyone have any last words are we doing the strandberg photo yeah does does everyone have their oh, guitar wait. nearby wait, wait. We, we did a thing yesterday where everyone held their guitar up I feel like an army. We all have our like our weapons. Yeah. <laughs> You're a little cultish. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it up, Aaron. I, no I brought out my my true temperament string guitar <laughs> to honor the occasion. <laughs> nice. Who's taking the photo? Awesome. That's all great. I I can do a screen grab from the uh, recording later. So we're all looking beautiful. That's great. <laughs> great stuff. Oh, yeah.
I wanted to thank Ed uh, because uh, he just uh, installed the new uh, the Michael Franks pickups in uh, in this, and I j- just got this back a, a short time ago, and just just did some my first recording with it, and it's it's very sweet. And looking forward to doing more. They are very- oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of you have um, had the the new pickups installed. Yep. So lots of good demo they- videos coming soon, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they will surely be the topic of uh, an upcoming uh, stream to uh, to talk about the pickups. All right, everyone. everyone. Thanks a million. I had a blast. Thank you, Ola. I hope you can do it again. Cheers, Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for hanging out. Yeah. Good to Take see you. Care. Hey, Plenty. Uh, <laughs> bye, guys. I'd like to ask you a question, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> I know.